I'd like to begin by thanking the Ulster Historical Foundation for inviting me to speak about the Great Parchment Book and the efforts by the London Metropolitan Archives, University College London, and the Derry City Council Heritage and Museum Service, amongst others, to make the text available to the public. It's been a tremendously exciting project to have been a part of. So I'm going to begin with a brief history of the book itself and the events leading to its current, rather unfortunate state, and the fact that it largely hasn't played a role in the history of the Ulster Plantation to date. Um, I will then move on to the project and the resulting website. And finally, I will delve into the Great Parchment Book itself in greater detail, describing how the book is structured, or at least how we think it was structured, and highlighting what I think are some interesting bits of information to be found in text. Um, and I have to state here that I'm not an expert in 17th century plantation history at all, so if some of the things I'm highlighting are blatantly obvious to some of you, please bear with me. I just thought they were interesting. Um, naturally, I encourage you all to explore the website and the book for yourself when you get the chance. It could, the book itself contains 165 folios and over 200,000 words, so I won't be able to do much more than scratch the surface today, but hopefully I can give some idea of what is to be found in it. So, first, some background. In 1785, the Honourable of the Irish Society decided to make some improvements in their offices at the Guildhall in London. According to their records, the chamber and the room over Guildhall porch and the staircase leading thereto were unsuitable. The Irish chamber was too small for transacting the usual business, and the staircase was very dark and inconvenient. In preparation for this work and for their safekeeping, the Society's records were packed and sealed in new boxes and deposited with the Chamberlain at his house in December of that year. Unfortunately, um, I expect you can guess what happened next. At about 3 a.m. on the morning of the 7th of February, 1786, a fire broke out of the Chamberlain's house. <coughs> According to the report in the Gentleman's Magazine at the time, <coughs> the wind being very high and the flames increasing with amazing rapidity soon destroyed the Chamberlain's office and greatly damaged the house adjoining. Amongst the damage records was the document that would become to be known as the Great Parchment Book. And although the Society ordered that the books and papers damaged in the fire were to be examined, arranged, and noted in a list, these orders do not seem to have been carried out with as much diligence as one might wish. So in 1819, the Secretary of the Irish Society, Henry Schultz, described the list of burnt materials as a loose and unintelligible production, and claimed that the important work of sorting through the damaged records was very negligently performed. No care was taken to investigate the burnt fragments. They were pronounced useless and thrown together in a mass and deposited in that state under more than half a ton of rubbish consisting of city records burnt to crusts. Schultz also mentioned the Great Parchment Book in his chronological history of the Irish Society and the Ulster Plantation, stating that this important document was greatly damaged. The fragments, however, which remain, are valuable and interesting as they elucidate the titles of the 12 chief companies to their manorial town lands, which are described by name. Unfortunately, the folios that make up the Great Parchment Book were damaged beyond the scope of 19th century repair methods, although some folios do show signs of earlier repair attempts, um, and, and this has rendered the text even more illegible. Um, and the book appears to have been largely neglected, perhaps unsurprisingly, and unavailable to researchers ever since. Um, so you can see here, that's the state of uh, what the parchment fragments were in before the conservation um, efforts began. Um, so the Great Parchment Book Project is the result of a collaborative undertaking to which many different institutions and individuals contributed time, money, and expertise. Um, there's a full list of them on the project website. Um, the manuscript itself is stored at the London Metropolitan Archives where the conservation and the digitization was carried out. The conservators cleaned the parchment. Um, you can see there uh, the difference that cleaning makes in legibility. There's before cleaning um, and there's after cleaning. So it does make a difference in the amount that you're able to read. Um, the conservators also developed ingenious methods for gently humidifying and opening up the wrinkles in the parchment. Um, <coughs> There, um, the conservators experimented with several different methods of humidifying the parchment and applying tension to sort of increase uh, the area you were able to see. Um, but this was found to be the most effective, so they used um, magnets 
um, placed around the edges to sort of hold the parchment in place. And then they placed polyester wadding underneath the parchment so that um, as it dried it would gently expand. Um, and this was found to be gentler on the parchment than using clips or other methods. Um, if you go on the website you can see um, illustrations of their trials on parchment. Um, when parchment is exposed to fire, it doesn't just blacken or burn, it shrivels and shrinks in an even manner, causing the text to become distorted, and it is not possible to restore the parchment to its original shape or flatness. Um, so, as you can see there, it's a rather unfortunate state. Uh, and there as well, um, there's not much you're going to be able to do with something in that shape. Um, thus, the Great Parchment Book came to be um, come affectionately known as the Great Papadom Book. Um, <laughs> as you can see that here in those um, folios that are laid out for repackaging. Um, after the conservation work was completed, the condition of the folios was still too fragile to allow them to be made widely available for, consulted, for consulting. And the edges of them are still flaky and crumbly, and some of the ink has become friable, so it easily flakes away from the surface. So, I mean, they're still quite fragile. Um, so it was decided to digitize the manuscript using specially developed imaging techniques to create a 3D model of the folio that can be digitally maneuvered and flattened, with extremely high resolution, allowing the user to zoom in enough to easily read the text. Um, and I should mention here that these images, they're still in the process of uploading them onto the website, um, simply because of the amount of time it takes to create them. Um, and a PhD student at UCL, Kazim Pal, was responsible for um, taking photographs and doing the digital side of the project. Um, but there you can see that's the, um, the high resolution image. So this is before digital flattening, you can see it's still quite bumpy. Um, and then after digital flattening, it becomes a lot flatter and easier to read. Um, the second phase of the project was the transcription of the manuscript, and this is what I was, was responsible for, leading to the creation of a searchable original transcript and a modernized transcript with a glossary of terms which may be unfamiliar to users, and with regularized spelling and punctuation as far as was possible. Um, so this is a screenshot of the website. Um, the website is, I don't know if you can read it, but it's greatparchmentbook.org, um, so that's pretty simple to remember. Um, so this here is the original transcript. Um, you've got square brackets which indicate where the text has been expanded from abbreviations. Um, and you've got bits in um, italics, um, there doesn't seem to be any here, where I've uh, supplied text which is illegible or missing. Um, and then if you click on this bit here, then it brings you to the modern transcript. Um, where you have certain words underlined and if you hover over them then it will bring up the definition um, of that word. And down here at the bottom you have people, places and companies, so if you click on that it will bring you to an alphabetized list of people mentioned place names for the different companies. Um, and over at the side here um, you have the original photograph of the folio, so that's not been um, you know, tampered with in any way at all. And then you have the enhanced folio, which you can click on to get the digital flattening that I showed you before. Um, so the website is designed to, to provide academics with a searchable transcription of the text, as well as high resolution photographs of the folios, but it was also designed to be accessible to the general public, those people who are interest, interested in genealogical research, um, that sort of thing. So I will now move on to a more detailed description of what the Great Parchment Book actually is and the sort of information contained within it. The book, dating from 1639, <coughs> contains a record of those lands held by the Irish Society and the London Livery Companies in the newly created county of Londonderry. The Irish Society's lands included the liberties of Londonderry and Coleraine, while each of the 12 great livery companies was allocated a proportion drawn by lot. The proportions vary in size due to the quality and type of the land. Some of the proportions contained a high proportion of good arable farmland, whilst others were largely composed of barren, rocky, boggy, or heavily wooded land. The woods, particularly at Glenconkin, were an important source of timber, but also served as protection for the Irish woodkern who were known to attack and rob the settlers. In addition, some of the proportions were quite fragmented or isolated, surrounded by native freeholds or church lands on which the native Irish were allowed to live. 
All of these lands were seized by the Crown after the trial at the Star Chamber in 1635, at which the city was declared guilty of not following the Articles of Plantation, particularly with regard to the replacement of Native Irish with British or Scottish settlers, the building and maintenance of houses, bonds, and castles, and the insurance that all tenants adhere to the Church of England rather than to the Catholic Church. Thus, in 1638, the Irish Society and the Livery Company surrendered their letters patent to the King, and in 1639, all deeds and records of their properties were given to the Attorney General. Charles I appointed a commission to survey all the seized castles, manors, tenements, and lands held by the companies and the Irish Society, and to negotiate new terms for leases. These leases were recorded and bound as a great parchment book. The original structure of the book is unknown to us, but we do have some idea of how it was put together and arranged. The leases were grouped according to which livery company they belonged, with separate sections for the lands in and around the city of Londonderry, the town of Coleraine, and lands held in fee simple by either British or Irish tenants. Um, and these last two sections, the lands held in fee simple, contain leases for lands held in all of the proportions. Um, so this is a list of the different sections of the book remaining. All of the leases are written in English. Um, there are two main scribes, the two hands that we can distinguish. And there's also a royal commission in Latin. We do not know in which order these sections were originally, but at some point, probably in the recent past, um, each section was assigned a letter of the alphabet and numbered consecutively in pencil in the right hand recto margin. Um, as you can see here, um, each section has a letter A, B, C, all the way down to R, which is the commission um, down here. <coughs> so the sections, say, of the lands held in the city of Londonderry are designated A, so each folio will have A1 on the side, A2, A3, etc. Um, you'll notice that there are no folios left for the merchant tailor section. Um, we don't know why. We don't know whether that's because they, those ones were destroyed. Um, it's hard to tell. Um, um, but there are sections in the uh, freehold lands relating to land held in the Berkshire Taylor's proportion. Um, there's just no section for that alone. Um, some of the other sections are also missing folios. Um, so for example, N, uh, the cloth workers one, they only have four folios, the end of it is missing. Um, some of the other ones, particularly A and B, Londonderry and Coleraine, um, and the freehold lines and the native lines are also, they have gaps in the middle of them and those folios are simply missing. Um, as well, the, some of the folios needed to be rearranged um, because they had been numbered wrong. Um, so this section, the folios in section P and Q, um, most of them were just labeled Q, so you wouldn't know if they were in P or Q unless you had read through them all um, and gone through them and noticed differences that made it Able, that made you able to tell which um, section they were in. Um, let's see. In addition, um, the folios in P and Q um, are in particularly bad shape. Um, some of them show traces of these earlier conservation efforts. Um, you can see here that some of them have been flattened to such a degree that they look like they've been ironed. I mean, obviously they haven't, but they are that flat. Um, Unfortunately, this makes it even harder to read because the parchment in these folios is so thin and so transparent um, and the ink is very, very faint. Um, and in addition, you've, some, you've got the case where there's been a smaller folio that, or a smaller fragment that actually is part of the same one, um, but it's been labeled as a separate one. Um, so there's some sort of fitting together of bits of parchment um, like a puzzle. Um, very, very annoying and time consuming puzzle. Um, so in the end, we decided that it would be easiest to load the folios onto the website in their designated alphabetical order, um, which may or may not be the original order of the book. Um, to tell. Um, so I'm now going to describe the basic layout and structure of the grant as it is seen on the folio. Um, and this is an example of one. Um, so starting in the left-hand margin here, you have the person's name. Um, and then there is the number of the grant or lease. So this is number 24, um, and you can see the surname Hart, um, and the, the first name is missing, but in the text here you can see that it was originally Frances Hart, and she is a widow, which is this side. Um, 
So the leases are numbered, and then you, as I said, you have their name in the margin. Um, sometimes there's more than one name because some leases are held <coughs> in several names. Um, in, in the right-hand margin, which you can't see here because it's uh, missing, there's a summary list or lists of the condition of the grant, which, and here's a close-up here. Um, so they always begin with the rent, um, the yearly rent. So here the yearly rent would be 13 pounds a year. Um, and it's done in pounds, shillings, and pence. Um, after that, there's usually listed the number of houses that be, must be built, um, rarely more than one. Here, obviously, there's none because there's no house listed. Um, followed by the number of closes, that is sections of land that must be fenced off or divided. Again, here there are none. Followed by the number of trees that must be planted every year. So, see, two trees must be planted. Um, or sometimes the number of acres that must be coppiced, followed by the number and type of weapons that the leaseholder is supposed to supply. So here you can see one pike and corselet. Um, muskets are more common than pikes and corselets. Um, and you also see the occasional mention of halberks, but there's no mention of swords or anything else. Um, the text of the commission is always in one large block, or sorry, the text of the lease is always in one large block. We'll go back here. Um, with obviously the signatures underneath. Um, and it always begins with the signatures of Ralph Whitfield and Thomas Fatherly, which are the two commissioners who are sent over. Um, and then the signature of the landholder, which would be over here somewhere, was together. Um, the first and last grants in each of the alphabetized sections are generally the longest, because in them every condition is laid out. Um, and these are presumably the grants for the farmers or for the major freeholders. Well, those um, grants in the middle of the section are much shorter and basically say that the tenant in them will follow the same condition, covenants, and agreements as in the foresaid agreement made by the said commissioners and which whoever the major grant holder was. Um, I suppose that's a way of saving um, parchment um, and making it go a little bit quicker. And so in these cases, the marginalia found on the right-hand side, that is the list of conditions, can be quite helpful in trying to fill in text that's been missing. Um, if there's a gap, say, in the number of muskets, but you know that this person is supposed to supply the same conditions as this earlier grant, then you can see that it would be the same number of muskets. Um, moving on to the actual text of the grant itself, it always begins with the date, name, and residence of the landholder, and either their social status, familial status, or occupation. For example, um, you have people described as gentlemen, yeomen, esquires, knights, sword bearers, and baronets. Um, and then you also see them described as either, as either the elder or the younger. Um, we've also seen people described as the son of a person or the heir of, and even one man described as a bachelor. Um, women are also landholders, usually they are widows, but um, as in this case here with Francis Hart. Um, but some are daughters of important or deceased landholders. Um, some of the women hold the property jointly with either a son or another male, and others hold it in their own name. There's also a wide variety of occupations, and these are largely found amongst the tenants of London Dairy and Coleraine, as a result of the craftsmen and tradesmen brought over, as has been said before, by the livery companies. So we see bakers, vintners, sailors, carpenters, mariners, shoemakers, bellmongers, butchers. There's a lot of merchants, clerks, husbandmen, masons, glaziers, um, button makers, lawyers. Um, there's innkeepers, there's a couple of tailors, um, a good deal of laborers, saddlers, smiths, um, malsters, chandlers, coopers, um, fishermen, ship carpenters, wheelwrights, tanners, mercers, weavers, um, victuallers. Brewers, slavers, cutlers, millers, linen weavers. Um, there's a couple of barber surgeons, a parson, some beer brewers, a pewterer, some felt makers, peddlers, and glovers. Um, so we get quite a good picture of the type of people who lived in the country, and it actually is quite varied, the sort of occupations that you have, um, and also the people's relationship with other people who have land as well. Um, next in the text, the lands are named. In the proportions held by the companies, lands are most often described as townlands. So it will say that this person and their assigned shall have and hold the townland or townlands, commonly called or known by the several name or names of, and then it will list the names. Um, the townlands are spelt phonetically, which leads to some interesting spellings. 
and not a little bit of time spent in checking if there is a modern equivalent um, for the modern transcript. Um, so we used modern um, place names where possible, although with the understanding that it might not be the exact same place. Um, holdings in London during coal reign refer to tenements, cottages, and mess lodges, in addition to buildings such as townhouses and kilns. <coughs> It is also evident that London Dairy and Coleraine were not very densely populated, as each tenement includes a garden and a backside, and sometimes an orchard. Um, you can see this in early maps of London Dairy, where the individual plots are quite large. Um, Coleraine at the time was pretty small, and so the individual <coughs> location of properties is not often specified, but within the city of London Dairy, um, it's different. And there we can see the use of street names some of which still survive, so they'll say property on Gracious Street, or Pump Street, Silver Street, or Butcher Street, which was also known as Shamble Street, and Queen Street, which is also known as Bishopsgate Street. Land is usually measured in acres, Irish acres, the document is always careful to specify, although roots, perches, and streets are also used. Um, Balibos are only mentioned a few times, and it is always as a named area of land, not as a unit of measurement, so it will say, so-and-so is supposed to hold the balibo called, and then it will give a name of the balibo, rather than saying they hold this many you know, balibos. Um, the, pro the properties are generally held for terms of 21 years, and rents are to be paid in equal portions at specified feast days. Properties in London Dairy were paid for on the feast of St. Michael the Archangel, that is Michaelmas, or the 29th of September, and the Annunciation of the Virgin Mary, or Lady Day, on the 25th of March. Um, or just on the Feast of the Annunciation, if only one payment per year was required. While the rest of the properties in the, um, in the other sections were paid for on the Feast of All Saints, or the 1st of November, and the Feast of Philip and Jacob, which is 1st of May, or just on the Feast of Philip and Jacob, and that was the most common, was 1st of May. Usually there is just a single rent to be paid each year, but some cases stipulate that the rent changes after a certain number of years. Um, after the land, its size, location, and perhaps some identifying features such as the presence of bog or mountainous ground have been described, the longer versions of the leases spell out some of the specific rights and responsibilities of the tenants that reflect concerns of the Crown regarding the process of plantation. So first of all, there are rules regarding the use and management of natural resources. Reserving unto His Majesty, His heirs and successors, the most lucrative beginning with the crown's right to salmon, eels, and other fish drawn from any waters on the land. The fisheries of the foil and the ban were famous and provided a major source of income. So His Majesty's tenants, farmers, and fishers also had free liberty to make houses, sheds, and other convenient places along the river, to stand and draw their nets and carry their fish on land and dry and amend their nets, and to do any other thing else whatsoever upon the premises concerning the said fisheries and this was to be allowed without let or interruption. Mm. Also reserved for the king are all timber and timber trees, storiers, saplings and great trees, mines and quarries. So by this time, as has been alluded to in some of the earlier papers, the great forests of Ulster had been largely destroyed due to the use of timber as a building material and the sale of timber, as well as to reduce the threat from the wood current who used the woods for cover. However, the tenants were allowed to take wood for building and firewood from the trunks, stumps, and bodies of dead trees fallen or lying upon the ground and not fit for building, and from the thorn bushes, shreddings, and lops of trees, and underwood growing upon the premises. And it seems to be the case that efforts were made to reverse the deforestation, as the majority of the leases require the yearly planting of a certain number of oak, ash, or elm trees that were fit and likely to grow to be timber trees. Sometimes only one or two trees, as we've seen um, before, but um, rising to as many or 20, 30 trees every year for the larger areas. And any of these trees that die are to be replaced. Some areas were also to be encompassed, and after each felling, the same amount must be encompassed again, so as to provide a steady supply of wood. So apart from these, there's also mention of the right to collect fuel from bogs, to collect lime to make limestone for building, and the rights of the freeholders to hawk, hunt, fish, and fowl upon the land at reasonable and convenient times. Following this is the need to build upon and properly manage the land. Properties were to be maintained and inhabited, fences were to be of quick set or double quick set with dikes and kept in good condition, 
Where houses of sufficient standard existed on the properties, this was acknowledged, but this was not always the case, particularly outside of London, Derry, and Coleraine. When houses were to be built, this was at the tenant's own costs and charges to be done within a certain number of years, and the house had to be erected and built and fully finished, so we weren't allowed to leave the job half done. The sufficient and substantial house, built of timber, stone, or brick, after the manner of an English house, was usually to be two stories high, with either four or six rooms at least. In addition, the tenant and his family was expected to be resident and inhabitant in and upon the premises from time to time during the course of the 21 years of the lease. Naturally, all of the buildings on the property are to be kept in good and sufficient reparations. Other developments, apart from houses, were also necessary. So we find the building and maintenance of wharfs and quays, and the provision of ferry services across the ban and the foil to transport all men, horses, cows, chattel goods, and all other things whatsoever portable. Third, there is the issue of defence, which we've also heard quite a lot about today. Many of the tenants were required to provide weapons on the proportion. Um, as mentioned, most commonly muskets or pikes and corslets. Um, and these weapons are to be kept in readiness for the service of his majesty, his heirs and successors. And the grants also referred to the muster master. Um, people are supposed to hold weapons as is allowed by the muster master of that county. Um, so again, this indicates that there's an effort to provide some degree of organization in the provision of weapons and the mustering of people for defense. Finally, there is a question of the tenants themselves. One of the most serious accusations laid against the companies was that they were allowing the native Irish to remain on the land and were turning a blind eye to the practice of Catholicism, which needed to be addressed. So evidence of this is found in a number of grants. For example, those that include the stipulation that the landholder shall, within a certain number of years, remove from the premises all such Irish people as shall not within that time conform themselves to the order and discipline of the Church of England and plant the premises with British people. Or there are the instructions that the tenant occupying the company's manor house or castle must reside there with a specified number of able and sufficient British, Scots or Irish conformable to the orders and discipline of the Church of England with their families. The grants of those who held land by fee simple, for example, that is either the freehold lands or the native lands, included an extra stipulation that they shall not nor will not demise or let the premises or any part thereof, nor voluntarily nor willingly suffer the same or any part thereof, to come to the hands or possession of any person or persons whatsoever that shall not then before have taken the oaths of allegiance and supremacy. A sufficient number of the grants, uh, sig sorry, a significant number of the grants, largely those to native Irish, judging from the surnames, include the further agreement and condition that if the said holder does not conform himself to the orders and discipline of the Church of England, that the Attorney General in England may put in writing that it is the King's will that the said landholder or their sign shall no longer hold or enjoy the premises. Thus, although the grants do not order the complete removal of the native Irish from the land, there does seem to be a concern that the tenants are seen to be following the Church of England rather than the Catholic Church. Um, there's a lot more detail I could go into about, you know, the provision of courts, jails, um, the use of mills, that sort of thing. Um, but I'll stop there. Um, so I realize that this has been a bit of a whirlwind tour through the Great Parchment book, but I hope I've given you some idea of the project, the book, and its contents. The Great Parchment Book is a hugely important document in our understanding of the <coughs> Ulster Plantation in the period between the trial at the Star Chamber and the Rebellion of 1641. I mean, it ties in nicely with the sorts of information that we've heard about today from the muster rolls and from the uh, port documents as well. Um, so when I was um, actually trying to carry out background research about the Great Parchment Book and the period when it was written, it was difficult to find a lot of significant information just from that period because we don't know very much about it compared to the plantation during, say, the 1620s because there just haven't been comparable sources, or there have been um, this, but it's just been unavailable. But now that the Great Parchment Book has become publicly accessible for perhaps the first time since its creation, historians and scholars should now be able to fill in some of these gaps in the story of the Ulster Plantation. I'm looking at, as you see, uh, a specific set uh, of records for this period, the, the leases of the Earl of Andrew estate from the 17th century. 
Um, we've, heard, we've heard of, I've already heard a bit about the about the Irish the, the, the McDonald's. They, they do keep turning up all over the place. Um, what's the knowledge of various people in the 17th century, as we said? Um, and we've heard a lot. We've heard some of you about Lisa, so I'm going to go into in more detail in that. By way of background, um, in this building, Crony, we have a large collection of landed estate records, records of the big landed estates <coughs> which dominate Irish society from the 17th through the 19th century. Um, we have a very good collection um, of, of, of these, most of which are catalogued, in some cases catalogued in excessive detail, um, particularly the releases of the Irish of Andrew for some reason. Um, the reason why we have them to a certain extent is because of that. Um, the Public Record Office in Ireland is opened in 1924. Uh, the old Public Record Office of Ireland burns down in 1922. Um, one of the lessons that Irish record keepers never learn is keeping ammunition and documents in the same building never works. Uh, but this the problems in the, in the 18th century as well, everything was tarred with the same issue. So storing the, storing the ready use ammunition and parchments in the same building, definitely not a good idea. Um, so, four courts burned down 22, makes a huge hole in the Irish historical record, basically the records of central government from the medieval uh, period onwards are destroyed. The role of the of the Irish archives since, to a certain extent, has been to look for replacements for those records. One of the places they looked for replacements, the first deputy keeper of the Northern Ireland Public Record Office, David Sharp, was very keen on this, somebody who worked in the OPROI, was to look for where there are copies of, of these documents and where there are other material which will throw light on what's happening. And he focused on the land of the states. Big land of the states all have big archives. They all have big houses, and if you have a big house, you have room to keep a lot of paper. So, leaving aside the ones that get burnt down in 1921, of course, most of these have survived in, in the big houses, and he then targets the, 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 the big house archives in the sense that he goes out to the land of and asks them to consider transferring the papers. Starting with the Duke of Abercorn, who was then governor uh, of Northern Ireland, he's the first major landowner to. Uh, to transfer stuff, but one of the early ones to do it to transfer stuff was the Earl of Andrum, and uh, that's the collection I'm going to focus on. The other place where we got this, by the way, I should, I should mention is solicitors' collections. In the old days, solicitors um, had, you know, charming old buildings. You, you know now they have these rather uh, squish modern buildings, uh, offices with no storage space, um, in, in the prestigious location which you're paying for through solicitors' fees. Um, I'm selling my house to the bank, by the way, if, 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 if I sound better on the subject. Uh, but in, in the old days, they, they had uh, this they tended to have all their old charming offices with lots of rooms, and then they, they tended to accumulate documents, because the documents just lay there. Uh, they took documents, they held documents for class, part of the service they did. They copied documents for a fee, of course, if you wanted a copy in those days, somebody had to sit there and write it out. And there were search fees, you know, when they, they looked through all these boxes to see if they found your documents. So they were very keen on these. This is changing during the 20th century, and a lot of them occurred to the deposit material with us. So we got these very big uh, solicitors' collections as well, which uh, go along with those landed estates. So huge collections like the Strange and Brett solicitors and, 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 and Belfast. So th those are the two sources where you get this sort of detailed record of land of estates. And the land of estate records, they are a very important source for anybody doing sort of any family or local history. They are not necessarily about the family, they are to a certain extent, but they also have a lot of other material on the um, actual running of these big estates and the people in them. And a big land estate is really like a large business. Uh, and you get the same sort of papers you get a business, but you can also get a lot of papers about the actual people on the estate. So I divide these land estate archives very roughly into two sorts of documents. You have documents relating to the ownership of the estate, the title deeds, so for instance most of these land estates date from the plantation period and they usually start with a patent from the Crown to the Earl of Andrew River granting him this property. In the case of the Andrew estate there's four patents in the case of about 10 years because somebody raised the question either of how the crime was making money out of the plantation and went down. One of the ways they were making money was granting patents, and granting the same patent four times is a pretty good way of making money. Uh, so you get the title deeds, you get the legal papers because they're very litigious, there's always disputes about the ownership of property. When the Irish aristocracy stopped dueling with each other in the 18th century, they then started suing each other. So you have all these legal papers building up. 
you have rules and testamentary papers are always a good source, you know, when the land has been transferred. Um, in the 19th century, you get the encumbered and land of the states courts when you're trying to sort out the mess the land of the states are in. Encumbered states is letting the landlord sell off some of the land. The land of the state is finally transferring the land to the tenants. Um, that produces a large amount of paperwork uh, uh, as well, some of which reflects back to the earlier period who was on the land in, in, in the earlier period. The other one you have, the other class of records we're looking at tonight, is the, the what you might call the operational records, the sort of day-to-day -day records of the running of the state. Um, leases and lease books, which I'm going to say more about early, the sample ones. You do get other things, the state corresponds. A lot of these states have an agent. If the landlord's not resident, he's writing all the time to explain what's going on. Some very good runs of land of estate correspondence in here, uh, particularly in the Abercorn estate. Not so much on the on the Antrims because they were generally actually in resident. You have rentals, rent books, rent ledgers, things like this, basically day-to-day -to -day tools of actually managing the estate. You can see who's paying the rent, who isn't paying the rent, who's getting in their arrears. And very important source of forcing what we have time to do today is mapping. Um, before ordinance survey, it is generally the landlords who are mapping the countryside. They are producing maps as working tools. And of course the whole thing about the plantation, it's all about land, it's all about transferring land and moving land and you need maps. And this is where you have the big upsurge in map making in Ireland as people trying to record uh, what is actually going on. So as I said, I'm going to focus on leases and just by a little bit of, bit, bit, bit of background on this. Leases are really an innovation in Ireland in this plantation era. Uh, there's a big change in land ownership for the obviously goes on in this period. Now this is done through the confiscation obviously and, and re-granting but it's also done in other ways. The courts are used quite interestingly enough uh, and there's a couple of rulings are obtained um, by the then Attorney General John Davies in the King's Court branch in Dublin which basically gets the court to rule that the Irish land tenure system is illegal and doesn't operate. Nice sweeping ruling, the judges say, throw all that stuff out. It is actually the English system of land ownership that operates in Ireland and always has done. Or at least down the back of the time of King John. So that's an interesting ruling and it also all our rulings where they say that being law has, has no application on this. Um, so this changes the whole basis of, of, of land ownership in Ireland. And it basically says the English system. Now the English system is feudal, or the term is usually used as bastard feudalism, which is not a comment on how it operates, but it basically means it's not real feudalism. It's not the, the feudal system of the Middle Ages. Uh, it was developed in England to a system which is sort of looks a bit like the old feudal system. But it basically means all the land in Ireland belongs to the king, the crown. He grants it out to people. They then sublet it out to other people. So you have this chain established. Under the old Gaelic system, the land theoretically belonged to the Tua, to, 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 the, to the tribe or to the people, but in fact generally belonged to whoever the local lord was, and he distributed among his followers. <coughs> often he distributed in return for service, not actually for cash rents, but for, often for, for service because they were working for the soldiers or, or whatever. And he has a system which is called clanship, builds up where actually people are dependent on, 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 on the lord. Um, they're moving with this new system from the 17th century, the bastard feudalism, you're moving over to a cash-based system, you know, the cash nexus as Marx called it, it's money rents, people are leasing out, getting money back. Now there is a certain element of people still getting services in exchange for the land, not getting money but doing service, doing work for the landowner, giving them animals or whatever, but generally it's moving over to this cash-based system where the landowner gets the land and then rents it out uh, for cash to people. This produces quite a lot of paper. Um, it, it is a system based uh, to benefit solicitors again. So I must, must get off this one. Um, so, but you know, a lot of paperwork is, is generated for this, and the paperwork is what we have here to a certain extent. Um, the um, and I mean, this is something that comes out by the way in the 1641 rising or, or, or rebellion, whatever you look at. Uh, one, of the, one of the themes, one of the motives that we run through it is rebels ransacking houses and destroying all the paper they can find. Now this may be a religious thing and it may be because they're looking for Protestant Bibles, Protestant uh, tracts they want to destroy, but it's probably also because they're tied up with this web of paper. They've all got into these legal agreements and they, they recognise paper as being something which has been used to oppress them. They've got agreements, they've got leases, and 1641, the first instinct is just destroy all the paper you can find. 
whatever else happens. Uh, now, quite a lot of it doesn't, it's destroyed and does survive, by the way, but it's interesting that, that, you know, that people are now seeing paper as this tool. And so paper, by paper, I mean paper and parchment, by the way. Quite a lot of this stuff is, is, is on parchment. Um, so leases are a very important part of this. And a lease is basically an agreement between the landlord and a tenant. You take this piece of land, in return you pay me this money. And as we see, it could be a wee bit more complicated than that. But this basic arrangement of leases uh, coming in now, and you have these written leases. And what I want to look at is the Antrim written lease to see what, what um, we can tell from them. <coughs> Um, we've very, very been mentioned is made of, of McDonald's. Um, a very interesting family who are sort of going against the tide at this period. Uh, Clan Donald traces their way, their, their lineage back to Summerland, or Summerland, um, which is probably a Viking who lands in the Western Islands at some stage in the 12th century. They become a major player in the Scottish Highlands. Uh, at one stage, they're one of the major players uh, in, in North and West Scotland. The, the, the acquire West becomes the worship of, of, of the Isles, a uh, very important political entity, uh, play a major part in Scottish, um, and of course they have this great struggle with the Campbells, who are the other major player in, in, in that area. In the 14th century, they move into Ireland, which they seem, they, they probably just see, you can see from that map there, they were the sounds just an extension of, of the Highlands and Islands. They move into Rathlin, which was really considered to be a Scottish island in this period, and then they move onto the Antrim coast, just a logical extension of the way they're moving. They, they move into the Glens area, they marry <coughs> into the, the Anglo Norman family, who theoretically controlled it, the visits, uh, and they become the lords of the Glens. And during the 16th century, they push the McQuillans out of the route, which is the area around Corey and the Lowland area in the north. So they become the lords of the Glens and off, off the route. Um, so very important players. Very important players in the 16th century in, in the great sort of struggles between the English Crown and the Gaelic Lords, between the O'Neills. Uh, they, they have this. <coughs> Um, empty with the O'Neills, they're always fighting against the O'Neills back and forward, or occasionally they're marrying into them, which is <laughs> just, just war for another war. Uh, <laughs> um, but, um, they, you know, but they have this, they're, they're part of this ongoing struggle in, in the northeast of, of Ireland uh, for, for control of that area. And they have acquired, you know, <coughs> they, they managed to get a very firm foothold here. There. 1603, James the Sixth of Scotland becomes James the First of England. James had already had a lot of contact um, with the McDonald's over the years and they had sided with him in the various disputes, so he's quite well disposed towards them. Um, Sorty Boy's son, um, Randall, Randall Aramak, is, major, is the major player as the head of family at this stage, and he obtains a grant by patent of um, an area of four baronies, um, I think it's 520 square miles of the north end of Antrim. It's that area in the red line there. So it's a huge area. Now, James, you know, wasn't doing as good as his heart, absolutely, because, you know, he was granting it to McDonald, who already had it. Um, it was probably, the game wasn't worth the candle trying to throw the McDonald's out of it, basically. Uh, so there's a certain extent of just acknowledging the reality that he was there, and was the dominant force, you might as well give him the title. But it allows McDonald to transfer himself from being a Gaelic tribal leader get a cheap rate of reward into a modern 17th century landlord and it takes the title of Earl of Antrim from the Crown. So they are sort of transferring, they're, they're, they're moving away from the, the old system to the new system. And as part of the deal, it's not sure a written deal, but there's an unwritten deal, MacDonald agrees that he is going to go along with the plantation scheme, which is going on. He is going to bring in Protestants uh, and Lowland Scots and English Protestant tenants into his estate. He's going to settle them there. He's going to support the church settlement. He's going to support the Church of Ireland, the, the established church, build churches for them. And he is generally going to play the game, uh, which he does. And he, he does it quite cleverly. Um, and it's worth pointing out, I always point out, I mean, we, we know we have the, the plantation in the, the West facing the flight of the Earls. You know, the, 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 the two major areas, the um, uh, O'Neill or Earl of Tyrone and Donald, they, are, they eventually have been harassed so much by the government in 1607 they actually flee and actually leave the area. 
McDonald, um, Earl of Antrim, he gets a similar amount of harassment. As I say, he's friendly with James I in London. The local administration do not like him, and Sir Arthur Chichester, who's, who becomes Lord Deputy, the, the Governor of, of Ireland, doesn't like him. Apart from that, else, he, he, he killed Chichester's brother. This wasn't, you know, one of these things that uh, he wasn't pretty over there. And he would, like, he would certainly like to have got rid of MacDonald as well, and he does try, but MacDonald is smarter and doesn't make a run for it. He just sits him out. Uh, and so he establishes themselves there. They remain, you know, they, they remain partly, the Gaelic heritage is still there, but they are transferring them, so reinventing themselves as Irish ascendancy landlords. Uh, and I should say the, 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 the Irish McDonald's have now more or less separated from the Scottish ones. The Irish estate is separate uh, to a large extent. They, they do make some attempts to, they make an attempt during the 17th century to um, take over Kintyre again, but that's followed up by the Scottish government. So, but they're basically now very much based in Ireland. Um, so, and that's, that's just a summary of it. The first Earl, um, you know, like, we don't even know when he was born, actually. Um, died 1630, uh, 1636. So he receives this grant, 520 square miles, 333,000 acres. 17th century doesn't go well. Second Earl runs up large debts, debts in the service of the Crown. Third Earl supports James II against William II. Two very bad moves there. <laughs> Running up debts in the service of the Stuart was never a good idea because he never got paid back by the, by the Crown. And he picked the loser in that particular fight, uh, the third Earl. So this um, does really eat into the estate one way or the other. The picture, by the way, is the second arrow, very much the restoration um, ground in that picture. Um, right. And I should say, I mean, as I say, that they that, that re-established themselves, uh, reinvent themselves, if you like, as Earls of Andrew, as Irish you know, landowners. They still have a hankering back to the old times, and one of the things, interesting things in the papers is this genealogy in English and Irish of Randall and the fourth Earl of Antrim. Where he's still, it's in Irish, interestingly enough, and he's tracing himself back to the great legendary Irish kings of the past. So the Gaelic heritage, the Gaelic tradition, isn't entirely, isn't entirely dead in the Antrims. They still have a hankering back after it. Uh, as well. Here's me turn out the documents like that. But anyway, let's move on to leases. Um, the um, there is about 340 17th century leases surviving in the Andrew Estate Papers. I know that because I listed them all. Um, the, um, they're very interesting range of, of material. Now that's not the complete, that is not every, every lease that will be issued or by any means. It is just what has survived. Uh, now as I said, Antrim goes along with the plantation stream, brings in English and Lowland Scots settlers into the area. By 1630, there are 814 Scots and 142 English men of elderly age on his estates. And half of these families, as we discussed earlier, are in Dunluce, the fertile land and the route, the rest around Glen Arm. But at least half of Andrew's chief tenants, his bigger tenants, are Irish or Highland Scots still. <coughs> Um, there are relatively few leases from the first, from the early period of the 17th century, unfortunately. Um, we'll, we'll see in a minute why that is. I just picked one here from 1625, um, just to look at it in, in a bit more detail. Um, a lot of these leases, uh, I don't want to get too technical into the legal jargon, mainly because I don't understand it myself, but um, the there's there's the straightforward lease where you give a piece of land for a fixed period of years and pay rent. There's also something called a fee farm. A fee farm is a permanent lease. The land goes permanently to the leasee and he pays a fixed, small fixed rent every year. Basically, it's a way of, sale, of selling land where you're not selling it. You still remain some rights and you still get this payment every year. But the payment is fixed and doesn't sort of um, have any lands for inflation. And the, the fee farms tend to be big estates or to be moved into sort of bigger uh, people who are setting up as landlords in their own right. This is Archibald Stewart of, of uh, Ballantoy. Stewart of Ballantoy become a major landlord and family in their, in their own right. Ballin, uh, Stewart also acts as agent um, for Antrim. He's very close to a partner of Antrim. Very major figure in this period, an important figure in 1641 as well. And this is a fee farm deed to Archibald Stewart. Uh, giving them the old town land of Ballylock Moor, Barney of Dunluce, the old town land of Ballantoy, and the Earl's Park called Altmore. So this is all up around Ballantoy. Along with the salmon fishing of 
Port Town Bain, which is probably Larry Bain up there, and Sheep Island, which is still there, a small island off, off the coast there, they still run sheep in the summer, and all the other little islands off there. So it's a mixture of lands and rights, fishing rights uh, and some small islands. It's only a part of what Stuart gets, this is just one document, but this is 1625, it's transferring over, rent of £15, which even in 1624 is not a lot for that, for that amount of land, so um, plus £3 respective fishing rights. There's also, as I said, the tradition of actually paying in kind rather than cash is still there. It talks about a barrel of wheat per year as well. Uh, and 50 cents king's rent. King's rent is tax which the landlords are paying to the, the crown, which the landlords, of course, are then passing on to the tenants, as they do. But you see there's a mixture of, it's mainly cash rent, but there is this thing in kind as well. They still have to provide a barrel of wheat every year. A uh, couple of interesting provisions in it. He's not to alien bargain or sell the premises to any person or persons other than those of the Scottish nation. Uh, with their identity's consent. So, um, as Emerson, he says Scottish, I'm not British, as there is as well, but so Andrew's got his own ideas of who he wants there. He wants Scots there. Uh, and Stuart's to make sure that he gets Scots in the area, not Irish, not English, but Scots. Um, Stuart's also uh, to contribute to the general hostings as other Scottish tenants in you know, about 40 days. This is interesting because this, the wording of that does take you back to before the sort of militia that John was talking about to the old system of hand hostings where the chief calls out all the locals to fight for him. And I rather suspect it's that he's thinking of rather than actually joining the militia. Uh, so he's saying if there's trouble, I expect you all to turn up uh, uh, and fight for me. And then he says the Scottish tenants. So he's expect if there's trouble, you gather all the Scottish guys uh, and could come and help me. Um, also, uh, one of the things, they, they, these estates were set up as manors in the English system, there was no real courts which dealt with sort of debts uh, and, uh, and small debts. He's actually, and this is a common in all of these leases, the tenants have to take their cases to the no real court, they're not to go to the Crown Courts. And they actually, some of them specifically say, you'll find them, you'll find them if they, go to the, if, if they take them to court. And this is quite interesting because Antrim is still very powerful in this area. He is going along with plantation, he is being nice with the government, but it's, it's more from other sources. The Crown Court couldn't operate in Antrim's estate. The High Sheriff of Antrim admitted at one stage he couldn't serve writs on Antrim's property. Antrim's, if you want the justice in Antrim, you want the justice, the you want the Antrim's courts, if you're one of his tenants. And that's written in the lease. You do not go to the Crown Court, you put a problem, you come to the High Courts. Uh, and there's some other stuff about building there, uh, I'll, I'll, there's one we'll look at later. Stuart, is, um, Stuart and his other tenant can take timber for building purposes, for, for ploughs, carts and manuring. Andrew will not demand, or, or demand rent or other duties in time of war or rebellion, which is very nice of him. Um, and it's part of a tyranny. And there's an afterthought as well, it's interesting, Andrew to have all the hawks from the Mise Nans. Hawks are a symbol of aristocracy. You know, the hawks are used by the upper class of hawking. Basically, he's saying, any hawks are mine. Keep your public military and public off, I want them. Uh, so it's an interesting piece of sort of class stuff coming through there, I thought. Uh, I'm going to quickly look at another of these. Um, <coughs> 1637, uh, there's a whole draft of about over 100 17 leases. What happens in 1637? You've got a new Earl, um, also called Randall the Second Earl. The political situation, social situation has changed. There's a new king in, um, or rather the new king, uh, Charles I in London. Randall feels he has to go to the London court, live in London for a while and make himself known in court. He has to raise money for that. Strangely enough, having a lot of land doesn't make you rich uh, in, in the 17th century. You've got to get people to give him rent or services in, in return for that, for that rent. He has to raise money quickly. What he does is he cancels all previous leases. We don't know how he does this, but just another example of just how he could be fairly arbitrary in his own area. He cancels all the other leases, says, right, everybody's going to get a new lease, and I want money up front for these. And what he does, there's two parts to the lease. There's, there's what you pay in rent, and there's what's called a fine. And a fine is just a paying of the cash along with, with the rent. And he fines up the leases. And this is a phrase he turns up later in our research, he's fining down the rent. Basically, he says, give me a big lump sum up front, and I'll give you a small rent for a long period. Now it's very bad business because it's his, it's his future income Go on, but he said, not interested, I need the money now, give me the money, here's the, what the new leases with big fines up front. And this is what he does and he raises a lot of money, goes to London, spills it like water, but, but he's actually successful because he does manage to, to marry a rich widow, which is what he was after all the, 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 the 
successful in the short term, the Buckingham family makes sure that her money act doesn't actually come to Randall. It's a complicated story, it's not easy being a relevant. Um, so this is one of the 1637 days, so just give you a wee bit more detail about what's going on. Uh, this was an interesting one. I picked this, I'd like to say I picked it on particularly a, on a story basis and all the rest of it. I picked it mainly because there's a type transcript with it, so I didn't have to actually read the thing. Um, but the um, some of these have been copied over the years and, you know, and, and the copies are available. And as the other thing, I mentioned a lot of, uh, of Irish on still in the state. This is um, Paul McAllister. Now the McAllisters are an interesting bunch. He could be Scottish or he could be Irish. Um, the McAllisters are a sub clan of, of the McDonald's. They probably come over in the 14th, 15th century as gallo glasses. They are probably clans of Antrims. They're probably fighting for him and he would have been given the land in return for the army services. But in 1637, there's still the same relationship, but the last relationship was transmuted. Now the Antrim is the landlord and he's given them a lease. Uh, so that's, they moved from the relationship as being sort of Norton and client, you know, captain and soldier to being landlord and, and tenant. But he's still looking after these people, uh, the, the McAllisters, who had traditionally had a look to him for, for leadership. Um, some interesting points in, in the lease. Um, it's, um, I'm not going through all, 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 all the legal stuff in it, but um, the lease gives transfers the land. It's for I think 21 years or 41 years. It's not a very long period actually. He doesn't actually trust the McAllisters that far. He doesn't give them a long lease, um, but he, he gives them. They take land for a set period, but accepts out of it mills, mill rates, ponds, mines, all the mineral rights are accepted. Those stay with Antrim, they're all the mineral rights. Not only is the mineral rights, he has the right to go into the estate anytime he feels like and actually do some mining. Uh, um, so, those are very important money raising things which he retains for himself. The salmon fishing is also retained, hawks and other game is also retained. The landlord keeps all of those rights. Um, as I said, there, there's a fairly big hefty payment up front um, and various other payments which I'll not go into, uh, various legal provisions about what happens if he doesn't pay the rent. Uh, hosting is also on this one, it's late as 1637, the hosting is still there, you will turn out um, for if there's trouble. Uh, for service, now he does say in 1637, um, the uh, you're responsible for a share of all the risings out and general hostings and all public services would be required to be done in the Havens of County Antrim for the service of His Majesty and his etc. So that is the official sort of line that he's basically putting in the lease as well as you, you will turn out for that. Uh, you'll use the manor courts, you'll use the, the Earl's Mill, a very important part of all these leases. The landlords generally held on the mills and the tenants had to use his mill at the prices he set. You couldn't go to another mill to, to get your uh, in. So, and also, very importantly, he, he, he specifies work to be done. So there's been closure work done, and it's very specific here. For the said term, he will enclose four acres of land per year, and he actually specifies, it's, it's an Irish acre, and he specifies 160 purchase in the acre. So they've then closed four, four, four acres of land per year, um, if it's not already enclosed. Which enclosure should be closed with a ditch three foot and a half broad and three foot deep, if the ground will permit, and if not, so far as the ground will permit. Uh, two foot uh, and a hedge, two and a half foot high, above the said ditch, uh, which well quick said it. Uh, so very specific uh, requirements for hedging and ditching land, and um, he was also to plant trees. He used to plant four trees per year per acre. You mentioned the deforestation. So some of the landlords were thinking about reforestation. They were telling the tenants to plant trees every year. Now, these are quite interesting um, uh, provisions and they show the, the idea he wants the landlords to, to improve. They do become standardized. One of the things I do notice is you get the same terms turning up in all the leases. I do wonder how seriously they are. They may have been a sort of um, become a standardised clause in the leases and certainly in later years when people get a lease, they get a, people get a new lease, they get, the, the old lease is, is, is recovered and you see these same terms coming into them again. So uh, whether that is actually ever enforced is an interesting question. Uh, so it's coming up to the end of my time I think, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So I was going to go on to look at uh, all the sorts of leases, I'm sure you've had. Well there's an uh, interesting point, that's the signature on it. He doesn't sign his name 
he makes his mark. So although he's a fairly major landowner, he, he's illiterate or he's illiterate in English. Interestingly, yeah, because this is an English document, possibly he could have written, he possibly, maybe never written Gaelic, but he, he, he makes a mark, he can't actually even send his own name in English. He does, they make that very interesting mark. And I say there are other sorts of leases which on another day I will go through, but they are, uh, they are all listed in catalogue and they are on our website, so um, you can follow up yourself. This paper today is really briefly to introduce you to the planter, the Toby Cool Field. And then I intend to wind the clock back um, and really trace the family's roots in medieval England. When I was looking through the Bob Hunter archive, which my colleague Ian catalogued last year, yeah. it coincided with me meeting um, descendants of the Caulfield family at the reopening of Listen House, in which I was asked to write the book, um, really charting the genealogical history of the Caulfield family. The Ulster Historical Foundation have agreed to publish the book and it will cover the period from 1450 to 1950. So this work kind of comes out of my first chapter, which is a work in progress, and also comes from um, the Bob Hunter archive, in particular document D4446-A-1-220, uh, byproduct of being an archivist, I do spout reference numbers, um, and that's the folder really that kind of sort of covers Bob Hunter's work on the Dictionary of National Biography entry that he did for Sir Toby Caulfield. So I will just say before I start, the spelling of the Caulfield name, I think I've come across 17 spellings thus far in my work. Caulfield um, with a, an E-I-L-D at the end to me is the proper spelling of the family name. You also get it with an I-E-L-D. Um, the medieval English also have Calf Hill, Caulfield, Caulfield, Calf with an E in the middle, Hill, um, Colts Hill with an S, presumably because the old medieval S used to be a long sloping one that looked like an F. Um, it's been transcribed in many ways, so there's kind of a few different ways in this, in this paper. Um, so Caulfield's story in Ulster starts with this man, Sir Toby Caulfield, um, born in 1565 at Great Milton in Oxfordshire and baptised as Toby, the son of Alexander Calf Hill, with an E in the middle. He was raised at Great Milton Manor um, until at least 1580. Toby's career began under Sir Martin Frobisher at the repulse of the Spanish Armada in 1588. He also served in the Azores, following which he served under the Earl of Essex at the capture of Cadiz in 1596. And it was with his work with the Earl of Essex that brought him to Ireland. So by 1601, Caulfield had joined the 8th Baron, Charles Mountjoy, in his campaign against the O'Neills of County Tyrone, and he was put in charge of the newly built Charlemont Fort, which guarded the passage over the River Blackwater, a site of strategic importance. In 1603, he received his knighthood from the newly crowned Kings James I of England and Ireland. So in 1610, sorry that should have come up before when I was talking about Charles, um, in 1610, in return for his service in Ireland, he was granted the manor of Orkleish, um, which had previously been held by the O'Donnelly family, a family who had provided military support um, to the O'Neills and who had been established in their manor and lands from around the late 13th century at their estate <coughs> Bally Donnelly. When the land passed to Sir Toby Caulfield, it was amounting to around a thousand acres that came into Toby's possession. It was renamed Castle Caulfield, obviously after the planter, who built his castle there between 1611 and 1619. It's now in the care of the Northern Ireland Environment Agency, and the bottom left-hand picture is the family's coat of arms, which has recently been done, redone, and it's it shown at the end of this presentation. Um, in terms of actually the arms, not the one on building. Um, excavations were carried out by Queen's University Belfast on behalf of the Northern Ireland Environment Agency two years ago, and their report demonstrated that no prior settlement had been on that site. So Caulfield built on an original raw virgin site, um, and it meant that the O'Donnelly family had held their seat elsewhere, and that 2011 archaeological report surmised that they had probably had their settlement at a Cranach or Cleish, around a kilometre west of the castle. I love this map. I can't understand it, but I love it, so I want to put it in the slide. Um, I think it forms the cover of Jonathan Barden's book on the plantation. It's totally mental, and that's probably why I do like it. Um, so the family were planted in Ulster. They rose to Barons, and then later by Count Charmont, and certainly Prony holds around, I did a search yesterday, around 600 documents relating to the Caulfield family from kind of ooh, the late 17th century and a push right the way up to probably the late 19th, early 20th century. 
And there's other records as well that relate to the estate management of the Charlemont estate, including correspondence with land agents, rent rolls, ledgers, leases granted. Um, the the Corfu family don't have an extent archive. It's not like the Earl of Antrim archive or the Duke of Abercorn archive. Or I can't quote a D number in Crony's collections that is for the Caulfield archive. That's partly why I'm writing the history because no one has really attempted to piece the whole family together. Um, they also held quite a lot of land with their um, fellow neighbours, the Staples family at Listen House, and certainly in the Staples family archive at D1567, there are lots of leases. I catalogued another batch last year that came in from the, from the trustees, and together these two families dominated large parts of County Tyrone. Obviously the Caulfield family um, had an interest in, and had, had history that preceded the Ulster Plantation, and the bulk of this paper will focus on Toby's father Alexander and his grandfather Humphrey. And if we look at the birth records for Sir Toby, um, as I said before, he was baptised at Great Milton in Oxfordshire in 1565. He was one of 12 children. Uh, George, the oldest, was born in 1545 and the youngest, Hester, was born in 1568. Their father, Alexander Caulfield, um, died in 1581 and a copy of his will is preserved in the National Archives at Kew and downloadable for a few pounds. It's very short, I was a bit disappointed, I must admit, when I got the will, I've been used to medieval wills that sort of name lots of different people. This will basically reads, in the name of God, the 29th of March, 1581, and in the year of the reign of our sovereign lady Elizabeth, by the grace of God, England, France and Ireland, Queen Defender of the Faith, the 23rd, I, Alexander Caulfield of Coedigo, in the counties of Salop, gent, sick in mind, yet if, sick, sick in body, but of yet good and perfect memory, do make of my last will and testament, in the manner and form following. First, I bequeath my soul to Almighty God, my Maker and Saviour, the usual kind of thing. Then it just says, item, I do give and bequeath all my goods, chattels, as well as real, personable, movable and immovable, unto Anne Caulfield, my wife. That's it. I was like, oh, that's really frustrating, because it doesn't actually say, oh, I leave this to so-and-so, leave that to so-and-so, anything like that. There are a number of witnesses, um, Richard Lloyd of Clan Madder, Rondell Ap Thomas, Richard Parslow and Richard Ap Rondell. Very Welsh names. Um, we find out that his wife's name was Anne. Um, he considers himself of Coenigo. And thirdly, that many of the um, witnesses have Welsh names. So on further investigation, Coenigo is a small hamlet, very close to the Anglo-Welsh border, and right in the middle of the Anglo-Welsh marches. And in one of the papers this morning, and I forget which one, because it's been quite a long day, um, there was a map showing the origins of the planter families, and one of them was the Midlands and the Welsh marches. The Caulfords were definitely a marcher family. Um, Oswald Street, right up in the northwest, Coenigo literally sits right on the Shropshire Welsh border. It's a very tiny hamlet. That's kind of indicative of the terrain around the area. It's mountainous, um, very pretty, um, very in the middle of nowhere. I'm sure it was even worse in medieval times, it was in the middle of nowhere. Um, so, Alexander, writing his will in 1581, had lived his life obviously in a period of great religious change, of social change, political upheaval. The beginnings of what is now called the Tudor period had coincided with the new dynasty in England, the reign of Henry VII, and obviously Henry VIII and all the changes that he instigated, the breaking away from papal supremacy, the dissolution of the monasteries, large tracts of the countryside were secularised following the dissolution of the monasteries, and obviously it wasn't just in England, it was a wider European reformation, but it would have affected people like Alexander and his father Humphrey living um, in medieval England. And certainly in terms of Alexander's own business, um, he disappeared to London. I'm going to return to him in a minute, but I want to stay in Shropshire for a second and talk about his father Humphrey, who was in Ludlow, right down the bottom of the county. So they, they, they didn't really go very far, but anyway. Um, Alexander Caulfield was born in 1520 to parents Humphrey Caulfield and his wife Mary. Humphrey Caulfield of Ludlow was a groom of the chamber of King Henry VIII, and there are within the Oakley Park collection in the Shropshire archives a number of items regarding two conveyance of property. Um, basically indicating that Humphrey was a fairly substantial landowner. Um, by the early 16th century, Ludlow was an established market town. It was an important strategic centre in the Anglo-Welsh marches. Um, it had been founded by the de Lacy family, the Anglo-Norman overlords, and certainly the Ludlow of Humphrey Carfield's day was prosperous, um, particularly in cloth, wool, livestock. And the, one of the town churches, St Lawrence, which was built in the 15th century, has huge massive stained glass windows. I couldn't really find a decent image that really portrayed them. Um, documenting the affluent nature of the town. So Ludlow's ex success had also been confirmed um, sort of during Humphrey's very early years um, when Edward IV decided to make the town the headquarters for the Council of the Marches, um, a body responsible for the administration of that whole area. Um, the Welsh Marches, if you don't know, why is that a beard? Go away. 
Um, the extent of Welsh marches imposed on the modern county map, it was a huge, huge area. Um, it was only really the, the far west of Wales that escaped, and then all of the five English bordering counties were, were called marcher lands. Somebody mentioned the Anglo-Scottish border earlier. The Anglo-Welsh border was an, as antagonistic, if you like, and had similar kind of problems, except for now I the first um, team this time. Um, in terms of the Welsh marches, it does cover over 6% of modern Wales. Um, Ludlow was prosperous and it was home to many merchants and administrators and town clerks. It was very administrative. The early modern bureaucratic structures that penetrated early modern England were felt in this region as well. And certainly within this landscape, that's where Humphrey went about his business. In the summer of 1509, he was appointed bailiff of the manor and lordship of Staunton Lacey, um, just to the north of Ludlow, and to the liberties of the lordship of Clearbury, Thalop in the manor um, as Thomas Madley, who had passed away. This is recorded in the letters and papers of King Henry VIII. There's a further mention of his role as bailiff in 1516 and a final one in April 1538. So these three sources, they're very tiny, they're very minuscule, they're not really kind of very major in their own right, but all three of them together kind of prove that Humphrey held his position as bailiff for over 30 years. So fairly substantial man, very well connected. So he played an important role in Ludlow and its environs in the southern portion of Shropshire. And also his son, Alexander, I'm going to return to him now, um, he's my favourite one of the family so far. He played an important role within his community, but it was far removed from the Welsh marches. He was a merchant tailor, and although his name is spelt with an S in the middle, um, I did finally find his um, I don't know, certificate of freedom, if you like, when he was, he was admitted to the merchant tailors, and he became a true citizen of London on the 12th of July, 1548. Medieval London, late medieval London. London Bridge, the only crossing of the river. The Merchant Tailors were one of the original 12 livery companies of London, and Patricia earlier in the Great Parchment book had given the letters, I think verses were number C, and I think the Merchant Tailors were further down. Yeah. That's pretty much the order that they were put in, I think, That's in 1515, that is the order, and the Merchant Tailors and the Skinners occupy 6th and 7th, depending on if you're in an odd or an even of the year, because they all thought that they were more <coughs> than they were. Um, my own doctoral research actually was on the Mercer's Company, and certainly it kind of concluded that members of such London companies were of high standing in the community. They were members of a, of a mercantile community that were the burgeoning middle class in late medieval and early modern London. Um, aldermen, mayors and other civil offices were, were drawn from this mercantile community. The companies were ranked in order of importance, the merchant tailors were 6th or 7th. And Really, to be a merchant was known as belonging to a group with a distinctive economic position. They control municipal government. They are responsible for basically making the city of London what it is today, the financial heartland of the UK. So, they all had a hall. That was the Merchant Tailors logo. That's obviously a later depiction. That's obviously not contemporary to Alexander Carfield. But the Merchant Tailors Hall is on the corner of Threadneedle Street, right in the middle um, of the city of London. And I think the ability to... The ability to trade in London um, was really only given to those individuals that had been granted the freedom of the city, and that was only possible through the membership of one of the London companies, hence the prestige attached to such status. There were various routes into the London companies. I did wonder how Alexander had kind of got his foot in the door, given that he came from rural Shropshire. Um, you either undertook an apprenticeship, so by servitude, you paid a hefty fee, you bought your way in, which was called redemption, or through patrimony. So if your father or your grandfather or your uncle was already a member of one of the London companies, the chances are they could get you in through the door as well. Um, Alexander's record with the Merchant Tailors, which is available online, um, shows that he, he did an apprenticeship, basically, and he could have been an under his apprenticeship for maybe six to 12 years. They did vary. They used to be kind of quite long apprentices, but once the 16th century kind of got underway, they tried to shorten them, basically, to, to get people through the books. And by the mid-16th century, um, over 90% of those being granted apprenticeship um, had indeed served, um, uh, granted freedom, had served an apprenticeship. And of course, Alexander Crawford was one of these. The chap that he served under, who was his master, was John Hoskins. Um, it could be the same John Hoskins who's mentioned in the London subsidy role in the 16th century, who was resident in Cordwain and Ward, one of the um, electoral and administrative units within late medieval London. Um, there's not many really decent maps that show the actual street layout, if you like, and some of them are very, very small and they don't transfer very well to the screen. I have handwritten a few of my own written before, but I thought I'd put a different map up now. So Alexander was in London at this time. Um, an increasingly number of young men um, were not the sons of young Londoners who were granted freedom to the city. And certainly from the merchant tailors beginnings in 1327 to the late 15th century, most of them were the sons of Londoners. 
Um, and I think as the 16th century went through, that's just indicative of the level of social change and how bureaucratic England had become, the centralisation of administration to London and how people were being drawn in from the provinces, including Alexander, um, who obviously had a father who had various lands and he chose to turn his back on that and sort of pursue his own path. Um, so we know where he worked and I found out where he lived. I mean, he did end up in Great Milton in Oxford, obviously, because that's where Sir Toby, our, our Oxford planter, was born. Um, as I said before, the mercantile community of late medieval London were a growing middle class and the city of London was growing um, at a, an alarming rate at that point and it was a distinct urban environment. Um, it was a city of divisions based on status and certainly the area between, I don't know whether anybody knows London, just north of the Thames, the street called Thames Street, and then also you've got, which is now Cheapside, which used to be um, east and west Cheap, and the middle strata used to be occupied by the merchants, so basically the whole of the northern embankment. And merchants generally lived in premises where they had a shop or a workspace or a bench below, and then maybe one or two private solar rooms above. Sometimes if they were not very rich merchants, or maybe they were still serving their apprenticeship, they used to live under the benches. Um, there's talk of people living in boxes under the benches where they worked, um, also to keep an eye on their goods to make sure nobody pinched them. Um, merchants generally lived all together. Households were not private spaces. Alexander wouldn't have had much space to himself. His, his office or his workshop would have opened out into a yard at the back. The privy would have been out there. There would have been smells and sounds and noise. It would have been a thoroughfare. Um, he occupied a property at Soper Lane, which is now um, under Queen Street. Um, it's a few centuries earlier than Alexander. It had been a, quite a dark, dank kind of alleyway that had linked Thames Street to Cheapside. Um, but by the time Alexander got there, it had kind of filled up with the great and the good and the movers and shakers, if you were, and certainly the Mayor of London, Sir Michael Dorman, lived there, the Warden to the Mercer's Company, um, William Bromwell, the Warden to the Grocer's Company, Richard Fermer. Um, they were all mingling around and living in Soper Lane at the same time that Alexander was there. So he was rubbing shoulders with some very influential people. There was a pub at the end of Soper Lane called The Mermaid. And I know from other records that I've looked at that a lot of the merchants congregated in this pub at the end of the day. I like to think that Alexander went in there for a pint of ale as well and was talking about his business. Um, he, that's the type of house, this is from York, obviously medieval London's planned. Um, that's the type of house that he would have lived in. There would have been a shop on the ground floor and then solas above. And the upstairs would have looked straight into your neighbour's property. That's so Lane today, that's well caught, just off of Queen Street. Um, I've been down in the cellar, you can see the medieval street grids from some of the cellars of the buildings. Um, that's quite amazing, but obviously it's a far cry from its medieval roots. Um, the first property that he lived, number 1A, was very small, he would have just had a bench and a room and that was it. Um, but then he crops up again later on in the 1550s where he signed a 20 year lease um, for a larger property. It was actually 33 <coughs> to 35 so they it was huge, it was really big, it would have been two houses gone into one, a double fronted to the street, possibly its own private yard opening out onto kind of the public yard at the back with the privies and everything, <coughs> and two to three storeys of private rooms, a very substantial property. He took a lease from that six years after he had been admitted the freedom of the company, so I'm assuming that his business was going well, he had spare cash, he could kind of rise his living standards, so to speak. Um, it was confusing because at that time he was also renting the property at Great Milton, where Toby was born, so after a bit more investigation, that's the, uh, the, the Great Milton Manor House, it's actually now Roman Blanc's uh, La Capre Saison restaurant. Um, it's all very nice, isn't it? So he took out this 21 year lease in 1566, um, including the Manor House, which is the restaurant. He appears to have moved his family to Great Milton, perhaps to be closer to his, youngest, uh, to his eldest son, who had started a studentship at Christchurch in Oxford. His brother James was also a canon at Oxford. Now James also, around that time, moved back to London to work in St Pancras. And so now I'm over coffee this morning, I was kind of having a chat with people and we was maybe thinking that maybe the, the Soper Lane property went into the kind of the, the rentship of his, or the stewardship of his brother, and he managed to maintain both properties. Um, in terms of how long the family were at Great Milton, there is a lawsuit recorded in 1580 whereby Ambrose Dormer, so the son of Sir Michael Dormer, who was the mayor who lived near Alexander, it's all very kind of intricate, um, but he basically tried to eject him. I don't know if he succeeded, I'm assuming that he did, because Alexander's will was written from Coedigo the following year, so I'm assuming the property at Great Milton kind of was no more, no more connections with the family, and that he had moved back to medieval Shropshire. Um, I think also it's kind of indicative of his status, the fact that he rented a property in London, he had the great, man, the, the great Milton Manor House, 
and I'm assuming the family still kept hold of their Oswald Street farm at Coenigo. So they obviously were a family of some substance. And I think it's clear to see that their medieval roots um, are, I think they are important. Bob Hunter certainly thought they are important. His files are full of his ideas and thoughts and research into families and where they came from before they planted in Ulster. And certainly his work on Caulfield has kind of led me on as well. And I'm just currently researching a kind of interesting link which, if proven, will take the family back to the 13th century. It's very tangible at the moment. I've got some people doing some linguistic analysis on the Middle English documents. But if it does, they could be um, related to the Anglo-Norman family, de Carvel, um, which would be lovely if I could take it back that far. So Toby, the planter, came from... That's it. That's the, the coat of arms. He came from a settled family of industrious mm -hmm. individuals with an albeit interesting but patchy archival history because the documents are scattered all over the place. So I hope that you found the paper interesting. I'll leave it there. I'll take some questions and thanks very much for your attention. Thank you very much.